All right, welcome. Thank you for, um, very much uh, for having me. As I said, my name is Eva Dekkers. I work at Philips Experience Design, as we call ourselves nowadays. Maybe uh, just as a little bit of understanding, uh, Philips Experience Design is a corporate design function. It houses almost 500 uh, designers that are our own employees. And if you count everyone from the outside that helps us, we are 600, maybe 600 plus designers uh, in the bigger uh, Philips uh, all over the world. Before I joined Philips um, in 2013, I actually conducted a PhD research into what I would now frame as a design perspective on artificial intelligence. And um, it made me a little bit nervous, but it's mostly exciting that I get to bring a nice parallel between the work I did in this research and what we are doing today um, with the data-enabled design team that I'm leading. Uh, which I can probably call a very talented team of uh, data designers that push what design can do by unleashing the power of bringing design, data, and artificial intelligence together. So the talk today about why designers should be building AI, it actually comes from something I you know, worry about. I had a professor, Case Overbeek, my late professor. He was an intelligent man, gifted speaker, and he would say to me and my fellow students, if they dig us up in 500 or 1,000 years from now, whoever they are, they will think that we are creatures with more than 26 fingers. Because they would dig up utensils like a simple keyboard, and they would think we would have 26 fingers to actually control the thing. It was not created to fit our body. It was created as a box around the technology. As so many things in this world have been pushed into the world, and I don't have to tell you, designers, that this happens, we push technology into uh, the world for great uh, applications that literally in the uh, Philips context save lives, but are often poor in understanding how it impacts our physical, uh, social health, well-being, um, um, so we have to think about it. So this is what I now worry about, is that um, when they dig us up, again, in 1,000 years from now, or a bit more, um, and whoever they is, they dig us up and they think that we were creatures that are unable to engage in any subjective, experiential, qualitative, perceptive interactions, engagements, because the AI systems they will dig up. <laughs> They are merely built to perform functional tasks, try to uh, perform objective tasks, and they do so very well. But where is this part of really engaging on all the qualities that we have, the subjective qualities that make us so intelligent? So while we are busy with measuring our business as a design community, while we are busy measuring our business impact, building our design systems and discussing the relevance or irrelevance of design thinking, which is all valid, and we should be doing that, I worry we are late to the party again, and this ship of technology is taking off without, we are, uh, without us being there to, uh, to help shape it and to put our design perspective towards it. I'm not the only one who made that observation, right? So um, there are others saying that. Recently, IBM has launched this design thinking course on specifically for AI. If you look at the Microsoft research blogs, you will find multiple interesting blogs that talk about how UX research will actually improve your AI or UI principles for AI. Also at MIT, they have brought together an interesting education and research program that deals um, with how um, we are building a human perspective to AI. And they are really keen on understanding um, how the intelligence evolves in the actual interaction and the intelligence is with that, uh, with that use as well as with the system and also making sure it results in meaningful and aesthetically uh, pleasant uh, uh, ways of interacting with these uh, systems. Um, also, uh, Stanford has uh, built for quite recently this Human Institute of, this, uh, Institute of Human-Centered AI and they have three areas of research of which the first one is human impact, where they research what is the impact of AI on us as humans and society at large, so maybe more the ethical uh, implications. 
A second topic, they look at augmenting human capabilities. So how can, that, uh, can AI actually help us in doing our work better, enhance our personal life? So really seeing it as a way that it extends our way of doing things. Like designers always look at, like a hammer also extends our way of actually making sure we can bang something into the wall. But so looking how can AI have uh, such function? And the third one is about the intelligence itself. How can we look at the versatility, the depth of human intelligence and uh, use that in the intelligence systems that we build? And it's there where I would like to relate also the work uh, I'm presenting uh, today. Uh, Philips also made a stand, and actually it's interesting, and it doesn't only come from Philips uh, design, but uh, Philips um, at large, we actually made a claim towards something that's more user-centered in terms of AI, and we are really um, making uh, sure that we combine our deep domain knowledge in healthcare with our technology knowledge and making sure we're building AI that is augmenting what clinicians and patients um, and consumers are going through. Philips, I was talking about healthcare already, so let me be very clear and let's make sure that we're all on the same page what Philips is all about. So Philips is a health technology company that recently slimmed down to that uh, essence. It still houses quite a broad portfolio of different businesses, which uh, ranges from oral healthcare, so toothbrushes, into precision diagnostics, from mother and childcare, so literally baby bottles, into image-guided uh, therapy, where we actually have minimal invasion, uh, invasive uh, devices to put a stand in someone's uh, arteries. So it's quite a uh, diverse, but we are really now uh, made a shift to focusing on this health uh, uh, care journey. And all these business businesses are more and more asked to deliver solutions that uh, go across this healthcare journey that clinicians, healthcare systems, and patients are on. And it looks a bit like this. So we, uh, we really, as Philips as a whole, put people, and the people we serve, and the health, they are held uh, at the heart of our mission and vision. And what we stand for is connecting up the so-called health continuum. So we are really addressing uh, health from the start to the end, and also making uh, 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 the loop. Um, so, if you want to connect this up, this also means that we, where we were a traditional hardware company, and we still are to a large extent, we've been moved to becoming a software company. We create a lot of software. And now also moving into, uh, of course, data and artificial intelligence and how that can support connecting up this health continuum. And uh, we and also other companies have shown first very interesting results in the uh, midst of, uh, of, of artificial intelligence. So there are examples in which we show that by going through vast amounts of images taken by an MR or a CT, we can improve image quality and we can help the radiologist to really more efficiently, more accurately and more timely actually look at the uh, cancer or other uh, type of disease uh, you want to diagnose. <laughs> Uh, we do the same in oncology, so we have something that's called computational pathology. So we can use all this data about the cancer cells and the healthy tissue and use that to better indicate and more precisely say where are the cancer cells. So there are interesting and good and great examples how more functional artificial intelligence is actually um, really helping our health uh, care providers and making the care more accurate. Um, but also at the same time, um, we also seen that if you see in how healthcare is transforming, and I, you know, we all know healthcare needs transformation because it's not affordable and not accessible to everyone. It's a complete different talk to talk about the transformation of healthcare, but we need to move there. And it's been established that the patient experience and the staff experience, so the professional caregiver experience, are crucial and really bringing this transformation in healthcare about. Which to me means that as design community, as field experience design, we have to take a role in bringing about solutions around data and artificial intelligence that look at the subjective and the experiential tasks uh, where we can engage on, uh, uh, on that level. 
which means for me in the future of Philips experience design, so all that I talk about is not about the, all the things that we're doing like really today to support our company and it's not like something that we do uh, at large extent yet uh, in our uh, design community. Um, but this is what we are building and where we're moving towards. And it's the belief that we have to ensure that we don't deliver meaningful experiences as such or meaningful uh, interactions, but that we really design for evolving experiences, which means that we personalize truly to the individual our solutions, that we individualize health care, both in the personal health and in the hardcore healthcare domain, to the patient at hand and to the uh, caregiver at hand that is helping, uh, supporting that patient. So for the design community, for our design uh, organization, this is what we envision this would mean for our, the way that we organize ourselves. It would mean that we have to find a way of connecting our design organization directly with the context of the user. And of course we do this as designers, we go out and we observe and we talk and we interview and we shadow and we have all our qualitative uh, research methods that we talked about also uh, already earlier uh, to today. And we use that to have an understanding of the user. But it's ad hoc, you know, and it's, as also heard earlier today, it's about also what people say often they do, not always about what they really do. So can we find ways to really make that connection which makes our design environment much more a virtual one and it also means it's a much more technology supported one in terms of computer science digital technologies and so forth more than it is uh, today what that would bring us or what that would result is in that we can actually bring continuous insights so instead of doing the ad hoc insights that we all agree at and uh, there's nothing wrong with that we would actually ourselves develop to bring continuous insight. Insight that considers behavior, considers experience, considers context. Things that are in the large data lakes that we actually saw this morning are often missing, right? So uh, how can we make sure we, we bring these kind of insights to the table? And then if we have that, can we also then do real-time design action? So what we as a community normally do, we, um, we, we investigate, we frame the concept, we then build it and we try and we test, we iterate and then we have a prototype and we put it for a while into the environment and then we learn and then we might go into the, we make some adaptions and we go into uh, developing it and we leave it out there. And especially in our context, in the Philips context, that is absolutely true. We have little clue to what really happens with our product in use. So, it is about making sure that we find a way of working that is open and continuous in which we could really have real-time design action, which is needed if we want to personalize our solutions. That doesn't come without tools and ways of working, of course. So I see it also as our responsibility um, for me and the data-enabled design team to make a start with that and think about what kind of tools do you need as design community to access data, to actually hands-on work with it? What kind of new capabilities do we need with that? And how can we use the existing design capabilities that uh, are still very uh, valid, obviously? How can we bring these together? So this is kind of the bigger picture of where we, I think we should be going uh, with our design organization. And that's why, as Philips Experience Design, we invested in this capability that we call uh, data-enabled design, that I have the pleasure of, uh, of leading. And um, data-enabled design is, in summary, about making sure that if we deliver solutions that encompass data and AI, can we make sure they are truly meaningful to the user? Um, there is a lot of functional AI and a lot of functional uh, propositions out there that I mentioned before. But how do we ma really make them workable? How do we really make sure they embed in the current workflows? And how do we make sure that they really also answer to the subjective and the qualitative needs, the social needs, the emotional needs we have as users? And then to establish that, we also need to treat data as an inherent part of our design process. And we've heard also how that can be uh, 
troublesome um, and has some challenges and needs a new vocabulary and also needs a complete new tool set. It needs these designers and that's uh, the people in my team that have hands-on, almost hardcore coding skills, programming skills to work with data while they're also good at bringing a proposition alive, bringing the design concept uh, alive. So what is it then that we do uh, in the team or what then uh, characterizes or what approaches would you find in the team of uh, data designers? We actually gather and explore with data, both qualitative and quantitative. So we go out and if we don't have the data, we collect it. So we hack our way into devices, we make sure that we have actual data to work with. Can be small data, doesn't have to be big data, but make sure that we have both qualitative and quantitative data from the actual context. This can also be more about the big data approach where we see that uh, people in my team are working with data sets from uh, uh, hospitals where we get access, which three years ago was impossible, but by now uh, we managed to do that. We really get access to these kind of data set, population health uh, uh, data and so forth to really then go and explore what's in there from that design or human perspective. Data in itself is not so interesting, all right? So it's about what you get from the data. So how do you go to insights? And of course we have uh, many established tools that mostly translate qualitative data into insights. That's what we all do. That's what I heard uh, this morning. When we make experience flows, blueprints and so forth, where we have these things that we saw happening in the world we translate them to insights that we could start uh, designing for. But we also need new tools, especially if we want to make a valuable, meaningful connection to the qualitative and the quantitative data. We need to think about tools that help us do that. That's not so easy. So we're building uh, these ways of how we go from data to insights. Um, we have to integrate this idea of data design with service design, UX design, any other design discipline, uh, if you will, to really make sure that it also then ends up, and as we heard before, in the end it's also business, we have to make sure that it ends up in differentiating propositions and products that uh, are also driving business. We are using the power of data visualization, so we both do that as a, use it as a tool to actually uh, create our own insights, but also make sure to, that others can have an insight, in, a different insight into data than they might have had uh, before. We have all know the nice dashboards with all these uh, nice BI tooling and they push out graphs and so forth, but there is more to it. So what kind of visualizations could we use to really bring out what we need to know or what we could possibly know from that uh, data? On the other hand, it's also proposition in itself. So we also see in the healthcare context that data visualization is a proposition in itself. So it can be really something differentiating as a product. Uh, so these are the two things we are, we are doing uh, uh, there. And we are building design tools. So we are uh, building ways of working and literal tools to give more of our design, more designers in our community access to this data and give them a way that they can actually participate in this kind of process without having these hardcore coding or programming skills. So the example you see here is that we actually build a little tool that helps you to uh, visually identify experiences. So you see some uh, raw data and uh, combined with qualitative data you could say this part of the data actually says something about this experience. In this case, I think it was about two brushing uh, uh, sessions. And then this tool will help you to find more instances of that experience. So you can qualitatively annotate uh, uh, the, the data stream and see if you can find more instances of that. So you could have this raw data um, and you could actually see if we could build a more experiential viewpoint uh, that designers are interested in uh, from there just to give uh, an example. And these were the five things that in my uh, previous presentations I used to talk about and I would give now a case study in which I would show you um, how that then all works. 
which I think would have been very interesting to do as well today. But as this conference is also specifically about design, data, and AI, I thought that I use this, um, uh, this opportunity to actually uh, uh, come with a new presentation, which I uh, add this approach or this task that I feel my team has, namely the one of building actual artificial intelligence. And of course, that's not saying that we have as designers to do that all by ourselves. We have to collaborate with data scientists, computer scientists, AI specialists on, uh, on doing that. But I would like to go through why I think and how I think we should actually be hands-on and build the capability to actually form and shape and build AI from this design and human perspective. And I see there are four tasks uh, for designers. And actually, now I'm going to do something that I thought made me a little bit nervous, but I'm, that's OK. I'll go back to my uh, PhD research, which is a bit over six years uh, old. I actually planned a nice movie for you to see what it uh, looked like, but uh, that's, not, that's not running. So I'll, I'll try like this. So this is my PhD research. It's academic research, right? Not applied design and practice. Um, I made this little light, a light you could interact with. And why was I doing that? I wanted to investigate this subjective, qualitative point of view towards artificial intelligence. And I thought about if we interact uh, with one another, it's about being involved, right? It's not just about processing signals in the context you are in. It's about really being involved with one another and understanding that I'm actually present in this situation. And I thought that was something, it's a quality that also AI systems could be able to have. So I started off with this idea, can we design for involvement between the system, the product, the artifact, and the user? Of course, there are then are different ways of going about this involvement, and you can have different approaches to it. The one I chose is something that's called perceptual crossing. And perceptual crossing is that, you know, uh, pay attention. You see that I'm seeing you, while all, I also see that you see me, right? <laughs> so I can see that you see me. I can see that you are listening to me because your eyes are in my direction. You <laughs> nod when you agree. You look a bit uh, figured when I say something that might be, make not that much sense. So it's clear that you're seeing me. At the same time, I'm trying to address my attention to the multiple of you. So I'm also acknowledging that I see you are here and that I can see that you're listening to me. So involvement is not about you processing the words that I'm speaking in your brain. It's about the fact that I know you listen to me. And that part, and of course, it's also about the processing. But in the end, it's a, the fact that we have this perceptual crossing, this qualitative interaction that makes you understand so much more of what I'm saying than just processing of my words, right? If I would stand to, uh, here like this, and I would just talk to the wall, you would take away a lot, a completely different thing from what I'm talking about today. So perceptual crossing as a design concept. At the same uh, time, um, this is also a concept you could actually model for, and that's something I want to stress. So it's something that we have to think about as designers. Can we come up with design concepts that I can not only actively design for, give a shape, give a material, give a digital expression? Can I also design something that I could model from a mathematical point of view, something that our machines understand? So uh, that's actually what we did also here. So I gave it this uh, very minimalistic uh, expression and I looked at the material and how could the light actually be best uh, coming out in this, uh, in this uh, little pillar. But at the same time, we also built the algorithm based on Bayesian theory of surprise, which means that the behavior of the light was actually steered by uh, this, this theory of, of surprise, which means that we gave it um, concepts like 
uh, expectation. So it was expecting something to happen, maybe. We also gave it a sense of insecurity. So it was not being, it was not able to see everything and know everything at the same time. And also important is that at some moment we gave it a kind of um, appreciation of the user. So it's not just that the light is reacting to the user, but at some point it also got an appreciation of me actually being there. And that's where we got to this idea of crossing. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that this intelligence could only arise, so this, this idea of understanding and appreciating from one another that we were in the same situation, and that I also with this pillar then had an idea that I was not standing just there talking to someone else uh, with my back towards it. That only evolves in the interaction. It is because I was active, because the light is active, that this intelligence evolves. So the intelligence strengthens while we interact with the system. So these are the four things that I saw, that I now in hindsight saw as a parallel between what I was doing then and what I see happening now in our team in this uh, data-enabled design projects that we run. So these are the four uh, uh, elements a little bit more generalized. So one, um, identify the design viewpoint. These are the viewpoints that the data scientist and the computer scientist generally will not bring forward. Um, frame the design concept, the thing you can design for as well as build a model for. Then go about and actually build the solution and build the actual model. And make sure that the intelligence actually builds up through the interaction. So how are we doing this? And this is uh, innovation work, so this is not something uh, you see out in the, in the market, but I have first examples of where we see design teams in collaboration with uh, technologists uh, working on this. So the case study is the so-called caring home, where we try to build an ecosystem of different products and uh, data inputs to see if we could uh, get a better understanding of uh, the persons using our devices and could act to that. Um, so really build the personalization. We use the data-enabled uh, design approach, which um, always means that it's situated. We really go into the context of people. It's data about real people in their home. So data is used as creative material, as I briefly touched upon before. It's experiential, so it works and it is there and we are uh, capable of evolving it while we go. And that's the last part, it's open and continuous. So that's also what I mentioned before. It's not a static prototype that we test, but we put something out that we are then able to evolve while we learn. This is very roughly the setup that we have. So we have a set of connected toothbrushes, a shaver, a Visipure, which is a skin cleaning uh, device. We had accelerometers and some other sensors that would give us more idea of the context. Uh, we had some uh, digital interfaces, uh, screen interfaces, which allowed us to have a conversation with the users um, and ask questions, uh, for example. We also very quickly saw that per family that we were engaging in, we would actually extend the ecosystem. So there was one family asking for connect, uh, to know, know more about cleaning their house, so we gave them a connected vacuum cleaner. Or they would know, to more, uh, know more about uh, environmental uh, uh, elements uh, uh, influencing their sleep, so we added in that utmost. So to show that we were able to make some changes to the setup while we learned. And also important to state, um, and this is sometimes a bit of the difference between the big data and small data approach, this is what a bathroom looks like, right? It's not the nice picture that also Philips portrays in their commercials. This is where people live in, and this is where you have to personalize in. So the first uh, point, identify the design viewpoint. And for us, that is idiosyncratic values for personalization. So it means we're really looking at the unique elements of a person. 
how did we came to this. So with this data-enabled design approach, really going into the context, it allowed us to actually gather data from different people. And we saw these kind of patterns. So this is brushing sessions for a uh, family, and we see nicely uh, a routine popping up and so forth. But it gave us little clues. So you see every day they are brushing, four people brushing around the same time and so forth. So we, yeah, we see a routine, a pattern. And you could do this over many families, and you could say something about routines. But we were doubtful, like, how is this helping us to deliver a personal uh, solution? This is another example. So here you see. Um, um, the duration of a brushing session, as well as the movement during a brushing session. And the, uh, in, uh, the, the dots with the same color are actually brushing sessions in the same family. So actually you see that uh, families brush alike, right? So there are similarities in how people brush. Again, interesting pattern, but how do we then personalize around that? And that's where we really, again, stress the combination of qualitative and quantitative data input. It was the combination of our interviews combined with these kind of routines and the deviations in these routines that really helped us to get to what is really personal about this data and unravel stories around data. So here you see actually that we, this VisaPure was used in a, very, in a way that we didn't expect. It was because this woman was using it to actually fight her migraine, not to clean her skin. So, and it's not about that we are now have to deliver a solution for that. It's more about understanding that this is the, personal, the, the level of personal you have to go to in, a, in this uh, approach to really deliver this personalized solution. Or another example of this kid that asked for a Fitbit. Right? Fitbit, it's about activity tracking, fitness, and so forth. No, she wanted it because she really wanted to show to her teacher that she was walking around too much with a heavy backpack. So this is personal data, right? This is the story. Again, it's not about now delivering a solution for that, but it's about how can we as designers find ways to unravel these kind of stories. So the design viewpoint is the unique value, the idiosyncratic values. Then uh, we have to frame the design concept, and we call that caring when it matters. So how can we now go, go about into this context and really think about when, how can we be there when it matters? We had different design opportunities. We saw that people need different levels of care. So sometimes people are fine and can need some inspiration. Sometimes people have something on their mind because they're going to the dentist and they need some support with that. And sometimes there's actually a problem and they need help or even professional help. So this could be an approach we could take we also saw that it's really about the moment, it's about the moment you actually get braces that you would need specialized attention for or, uh, hygiene, for example. And that's a pers about personalized growth, that the system can grow along with these moments and these topics that you are specifically interested in. So we decided to bring this together into a design concept that we call this caring when it matters, which we believe that we could both build a solution around, as well as model some intelligence to find out when it matters and what matters. So that's what we then uh, uh, did. And this is where we went uh, to. So it's actually um, about connecting an interest profile to so-called so care modules. So this is the model that we started to build. This is what it roughly looks like. So in the middle, we are building an interest profile. What is this person? What's on the mind of this person? What does this person mean? When need? When does this person need it? And can we connect it to relevant information, services, solutions to actually address that need? We have different data trackers that I showed you before that we can actually use to build the interest profile, and we have the digital uh, output like the screen-based uh, interactions and also maybe physical feedback on our devices to bring these care modules towards our uh, users. So um, this is the conversational UI that we were using. I think it's very important to mention this because it, at this point in the study, we stopped actually visiting the families for frequent interviews. So we had to have a way of getting subjective data and in the moment, ask in the moment questions about the use of the products and so forth. So partly automated, hugely manually, 
we build this conversational UI in which we could actually uh, connect the data we were getting in and subjective questions and storytelling from the user's uh, site. Um, this is an example of a, a generic tracker where we could see when people were watching TV, for uh, examples, is connected to uh, plug. Uh, and of course, the devices as I uh, shown uh, before. And this is a sneak preview into what we were then building in the uh, background. So over time, we were able to build an interest profile that actually changed over time uh, with the person. Again, there's some manual uh, inputs for that, but certainly also we were able to um, do some automation uh, in there. The question now is how can we evolve that further and collaborate with the data scientists and the AI experts further to build this. This is just to give you an impression of all the conversations we were having with these uh, participants. This is not a Philips product out in the market, this is our research, design research environment in which we were interacting with these users. And the subjective conversations were very, very important to make sense of the data. And it will also be when we move this into the real world, uh, let's say, into business world. And then intelligence is actually strengthened in the interaction. And I'll show you an example of the toothbrush that will not switch off, which is a terrible concept, right? If you would think of it from the beginning. But it was not to the person that we actually gave a toothbrush that would not switch off because actually we came to the concept and this solution in the conversation. The system came to this solution in the conversation with this person. So we learned about uh, her brushing routines and we immediately found out that this lady was not brushing the two minutes that are uh, advised. She was just not making it. Uh, on the other hand, she did worry about cavities, so there was a little bit of a contradiction there. So we used, uh, we, we tried to give her some more uh, uh, articles on that. We tried to give her uh, reminders, it didn't work. So she didn't get to the two minutes. So we got the system asked her some questions like, how would you like to be approached? And she actually said, yeah, I can be pushed. So we had a way of actually controlling the toothbrush. So the toothbrush would not actually switch off unless she would brush for two minutes. It's a bit of a humoristic maybe example, but it shows that when you build this together with the person while they are interacting in their context, you'll find solutions that do not go for the mass. If you're able to control the settings of the toothbrush, there are hundreds of possibility, a possibility for every need that a person uh, might have. Um, this was in the personal health uh, area. We're also working on different cases where I can draw the same parallel of the four uh, uh, points. One is actually where we're working on is where we're bringing in oncology, really making sure that we bring predictive models that balance the clinical outcome and the quality of life. So really thinking about the subjective and qualitative um, uh, perceptions of the patient, not just the clinical outcome. Or in another example, we are working with bariatric patients, so people that are obese and went through a stomach re uh, a reduction uh, a surgery, where we actually help to understand, much like the caring home, understand what is helping or preventing them from adhering to their care part, adhering to a lifestyle change. And can we build a model to actually help them um, and understand where to support and when to support? So for today, I know I give you a lot of information and this is what I would like you uh, to take away is that designers should take an active role in shaping AI, that we have to build design viewpoints on this, that we have to build the models ourselves in collaboration, obviously, um, and that we have to make sure that intelligence is actually something that unfolds while we interact. And uh, as in earlier uh, talks, I cannot stress enough that it's about bringing the qualitative and the quantitative together and making sense of that. And that understanding of the user that we as designers bring to the table is something we start designing into our solutions. Thank you. <laughs>